game. So, um, hi everyone, welcome to Lawyer's Six educational webinar. And this is actually incredible. And I would like, and I would like to thank all of you for constant support and constant interest in our events because you actually motivate us to create more events like this and to invite more speakers and you know cover more interesting topics. So, thank you so much. And uh, before we actually jump into today's event, I would love to tell a couple of words about our product, Loyo, which is a contract review software. So, if you want to save some money, save some time, and you know, if you want a tool to be able to help you to spot some possible issues in your contracts, etc. So, uh, Loyo could be a choice for you. So, if you have any issues or pain points in your contract review process, you can book a quick call with me or one of our team members, and we would love to you know to hear to your, to listen to your questions and possibly help you resolve your pain points so um our team will actually send a link for booking a call with us in live chat in if you if you have any questions feel free to to book a spot with us so uh today we are actually going to talk uh to three small law firm owners who who had a success stories with their companies and who have successfully implemented technology and innovation to improve their processes and efficiency. So let me introduce uh, our wonderful speakers and let me start with Joshua D. Brinen, the founder and the owner of Brinen and Associates, a New York headquartered planning and transaction oriented boutique law firm operating internationally. Welcome, Joshua. Good afternoon. Great to have you here. Uh, and our next guest today is Owen McGran. He's uh, the founding member of McGran Law LLC, a Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh headquartered boutique estate planning and small business firm. Welcome. Welcome, Owen. Thank you very much. And our third guest is Brooks Derrick, the owner at Derrick Law Office, a Simpsonville based personal injury law office. Welcome, Brooks. Um, so it's really great to have all of you here today. And uh, before we jump into our you know, webinar, let me outline the structure of today's event. So first of all, we're going to go over some of the questions that we have uh, initially posted on our website. Uh, and then we will have time for a Q&A session from the audience. So for those of you who are watching us right now, please make sure to send us your questions in live chat. And at the end of today's event, uh, Joshua, Brooks, and Owen will, will actually choose the best question, their favorite question. And the winner you know, of, of, of the best question will actually get a present for, from us, which is a $100 Amazon gift card and one year uh, subscription with Loyo. So uh, good luck, everyone. Make sure to send us your questions. And I'm sure you, know, you, you have a lot to learn from our today's speakers. And uh, let's just you know, dive in and have an exciting and interesting discussion. Um, so, um, you know, one of the first questions I want to ask you is actually, you know, I would really love to hear more about you and your success stories. So can you tell us a couple of words about the beginning of your small law firm journey and how did you come to today's point of your business development? Um, Joshua, shall we start with you? Sure. Um... <laughs> I just think it's funny that you're saying what would my success story would be or how I started because basically, and I, I think I'm similar with with my two colleagues, you know, my journey started with me telling my boss, I look at you and I see an empty chair. Um, basically, I was, I, I was fed up with working for somebody else and I called my mom and her response was, oh, thank the Lord. Watching you try to be an employee has been the hardest thing I've ever had to do. And that was it. My wife did a logo that we still use. I got a phone number, an email, uh, and, and 
and the let, letterhead and insurance. And I was by three o'clock that afternoon, I was on my own. Well, that takes some guts, definitely. I mean, or, or, or really a complete lack of understanding of what it's going to take. <laughs> well, well, I guess oh, we'll talk, talk about that. Back me up on this. <laughs> Obviously. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you, Joshua. Owen, what about you? Um, my journey um, it has a lot of similarities to, to Josh. Um, you know, my, my last review um, included the phrase um, insubordinate, even if usually correct. Um, and I realized that I was a terrible employee, but um, I'm pretty good at working for myself and for the people that that I care about. So um, I decided that uh, the big behemoth law firm was um, not a good place for me. Um, and so I, I broke out and, and started my own place. Um, ran into a bit of a hiccup in that I got seriously ill and almost died a couple of times. Um, but you know, one of the things that that instilled in me is a, a sort of ruthlessness about doing only what I want to do. Um, and, you know, it's enabled me to shape my firm um, in the image of the kind of uh, impression that I want to leave on on my clients in the world. Thank you. Thank you, Owen. Brooks, now it's your time to tell us your story. Well, my, my uh, beginnings beginnings of my own firm are, are kind of similar to Owen and Josh's, but uh, unlike them making the decision and realizing that they were a terrible employee, um, I learned that from people that were working above me. Um, I had a fantastic job. I finished law school in 07. I had a fantastic job um, at a fantastic law firm with fantastic people, um, but I was uh, in a very weird personal place with uh, I was going through a divorce somehow I was going through a divorce my, during that year of taking the bar exam and I was a horrible employee and the next thing I knew I was walking down the street in Charleston South Carolina trying to figure out what the hell I was going to do um and I walked into a buddy's house and our buddy's uh buddy's office and he pointed me in the direction of a book and I started reading that book and just like Josh, next thing I knew I had a website and a phone number and uh, rented some space and started on this journey. And that was, I don't know how long ago it was, 2008. So whatever that math is, and here I am. Well, it's the best thing that ever happened to me, but it was <laughs> shitty. Sh I'm, I'm sorry, crap. It was really <laughs> crappy at the time, sorry. <laughs> No worries. <laughs> Wait, good, what's the record? good southern tongue is yeah is speaking right. incorrectly here. If if you're an attorney, it's the same for all. Yeah, it's all good. But for, for the record, you got out of law school in in 2007. I got out in 97. So well, I, I got out. Of, how, how great you are! I, I got out in 99, right when all the jobs disappeared. Oh yeah, yes. no, no, same. <laughs> <laughs> Well, um, anyways, it seems like all of you are in a good place now and, you know, we're having this discussion. So um, I guess, Brooks, why don't you, you know, we continue with you and uh, maybe you could tell us, you know, if you think that the narrative around being efficient as a small law firm getting stronger and why do you think it's important for small law firm owners to be effective and, and, and to, you know, drive their business to success? I think that there are... I think the narrative is getting stronger within the communities that probably the three of us and probably you two, Elena, talk amongst ourselves. I think that narrative is getting stronger and stronger and stronger. But I also think that there is a parallel uh, group of humans that are still thinking about law firm ownership and law and law firm employees in a way of Let's just keep adding people and we'll make more money. Um, not really still thinking about the, the way that the practice law or the way to draft documents or the way to find documents or send letters or whatever. They're still operating in a, in a 1995 or 2005 kind of mindset. But there are the narrative for more efficient law firm ownership is definitely getting stronger for the folks like us. I, I just think there's two different tracks. Um, 
And there might be some young lawyers that are in firms that are still on that other track that are trying to figure out what the hell to do. Um, I, I, my own journey about efficiency um, of all people came from my father, uh, who was a radiologist in the 80s. And he spent four or $5,000 on a typewriter, okay, that, in, uh, that had a little screen so you could see what was being typed before you hit the button to hit the button, and you could program it. And he explained to me that the, that a chest X-ray, which is the simplest form of X-ray, okay, if it's positive, it's a custom job. But all negative chest X-rays are the same. So he programmed all of his negative reports to make his getting reports out faster. And so I've tried to internalize that in using technology to be more efficient, okay? A simple, what Owen would refer to as an I love you will, or a, or a simple um, non-disclosure agreement. You can charge X on a flat fee, but it shouldn't take you this much time. It should take you this much time. Yeah, And then at least to get them the first draft. Now, they have all sorts of bells and whistles they want. Like one thing I, I now realize I have to do for my an NDA that I was working on this morning was I have to consider alternate collaboration platforms like Slack, which I had to go, yeah, Owen's nodding. I had to figure out what Slack was, okay? <laughs> and then I had to explain it. But that kind of, whatever can be productized, okay, should be productized. And that's where things like Lolio and other um, add-ins to Word are huge. Thank you, Joshua. And we're actually getting to, to our conversation, main conversation topic, technology and using technology, you know, as a small law firm leader. So, Owen, uh, perhaps you could share from your perspective, why do you think it's actually, you know, getting becoming important to utilize technology for, for a small law firm? Well, I, I think that there are a bunch of reasons, but the, the most paramount to me is when I step back and, and really thought about why clients would go with a smaller law firm versus, you know, a monster. Um, I realized that clients want to work with a small law firm because they want to work with somebody that they can actually know a little bit and get in touch with when necessary. And if, you know, part of my practice is estate planning, if all I'm doing is sitting and drafting documents, I'm not attending to my clients the way that I should be. Right. So, the the automation that i've put together for my firm on the um, uh, estate planning side it enables me to spend my time where it should be which is sitting with my clients understanding what their issues are uh going over the strategy for how to do things rather than just handing them documents so for small law firms i think that is especially important um to use the tech to enable you to do the things that only a lawyer can do, which is sit down and talk with your client, explain things, hear what they are saying, what they need, what they want, what they fear, and then worry about the, the documents um, coming from, you know, an automation and all you have to do is review them rather than spend all your time creating. Or at home with your family, Owen, <laughs> right? Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Work -life. Work-life balance is important. <laughs> oh, no, no, hold on. Time out. I got three teenage daughters. I'm good. Okay, I'm good. You want to be at the office. <laughs> I Well, my office is in my home. Or in the room. I want the door closed. Go go I want room. the door closed. Okay? Um, yeah, I want the door closed. <laughs> I have a three-year-old and a one-year-old, so I love to be at home playing with those guys. Oh. I'm still in the, in the precious moments. Oh, no, they're adorable at that age. Okay? <laughs> Ah, uh, great, great. Well, um, Joshua, in one of our personal conversations, you actually said that you saved a considerable amount of time and money using, you know, contract review technologies, even such as Loyo. So I guess my question is, how does using technology influence a small law firm's profitability? And, you know, 
Why is this the case? My job, like Owen, is not to sit there, since I'm older than these guys, with a ruler, okay, going through a document over and over and over again. Okay, I was never good with a secretary because I typed 90 words a minute. Okay, I think the best secretary I've ever had was 75, but I, I, I'm 90, okay, with accuracy. So having an assistant was never helpful, okay? Being able to offload these menial but necessary tasks for things that are relatively straightforward and even 75% productized means that I can say, okay, little program, go do that over there on that screen. I'm going to do something on this screen and answer an email or, or, or do something important while billing on that third screen. And it, it's very important. You need to be able to leverage your time because there's only 24 hours in a day. Um, and, and, you know, you got to sleep sometime, no matter how many times I'm, you know, knocking back tea and coffee all day. So offloading these menial tasks is very important. Yeah, exactly. Offloading these menial tasks is very <laughs> important. Okay. Also because clients don't really like it when you bill them to go over the fifth draft where you're just yeah, I'm <laughs> getting a lot of nods from Owen. <laughs> you know, it you need to be able to leverage because you know, to take it back one step. I practice in securities and tax and litigation in New York, okay? The biggest of all big firm kind of meccas, okay? In the 80s and even the 90s, I could not compete with those large law firms. In 2021, I can compete on ideas because execution using you know, technology and, and be able to produce an A minus version of the A plus product is incredible. The last uh, registration statement I put in, which normally takes months to get through, I got done in using Lolio, got done in five days, one of which was Thanksgiving. Client was over the moon. <laughs> Right. And I, I think one of the things that you point out here, which is important for small law firms, is the tech, the tech evens the playing field for small firms in a way that mm -hmm. even five years ago wasn't the case. So what you're able to do is leverage the tech to be able to punch way above your weight class. Oh, yes. Now, tra uh, traditionally speaking. And, and it just becomes a competition of ideas. Right. You know, right. and uh, I, I'm sure you guys have noticed um, a lot of lawyers at big law firms are smart people, but they have the same ideas over and over again. And small law firms, the lawyers there tend to be a, a good bit more innovative, I think, in the way that they think about things. I'm going to respectfully disagree with Mr. McGran, because the last time I was in court against a big law firm, as I'm walking out, my comment was, next time, bring kryptonite. <laughs> we wow. don't have... We don't have the resources that big law firms do. Mm -hmm. Okay. And to quote my, one of my favorite philosophers and musicians, Leonard Bernstein, all it takes to do great things is to have a plan and not quite enough time. So my position mm -hmm. is, is that mm -hmm. big law firms are a good place to maybe get trained. But if you really want to get into it and do, and, oh. and, and do, what we do, you know, you definitely get, you definitely need the technology to punch in that weight class, but it's all up here. Mm -hmm. And I think the small firm people generally are better here because we have to do more with less. I, I agree completely, right? So the, the, the importance of the tech is that it gets us on the platform where we're able to, um, it, it becomes a fair fight because the resources are no longer 
the critical aspect of you know um, how how a case is going to go or oh, absolutely you know, um, you know and and that's one of the things that that I found so heartening you know as I've instituted you know more tech and in, in, in my workflows and the way that I do things is um, I no longer feel like I'm uh, fighting with a hand behind my back. Thank for you. me, the, I think for me, the, the, the secret sauce, I'm a personal injury lawyer, so all of my cases are contingency fee, but this also could ring true for a transactional lawyer too. The secret sauce is getting from, from start to finish in the fastest amount of time, or at least from start to determination of whether or not we can finish it now. Like for, for me, getting to a point where I can make a settlement proposal or getting for y'all, for Owen, getting to the point where you can present that first draft to the client, right? That's when we can, that's when we all can actually make money, mm -hmm. bring that money in uh, or earn that money, I guess. And technology for us closes that gap. Like I want my cycle time from the time the person walks in the door to the time that I can potentially send a settlement proposal out. I want that to be as small as possible. Mm -hmm. um, or I guess maybe even more dependent upon they finish treatment and then I want that settlement proposal to be done and out the door in as few days as possible. And technology and having all of those processes and procedures and, and forms and automations set into place, technology allows that, that gap to be as small as possible. Whereas if I was having to continuously open up and say, let me pull up. What was the last time I did this? You know, uh, a demand letter for the for a slip and fall at Walmart. Oh, that was the Jones case. And go find the Jones demand letter. Pull that thing back out. Um, versus if I can be if I can have all the information I need already in my case management software or document management software that will allow me to hit a couple buttons, bring that up. In 15 minutes, I can have my thing finished. That changes the game. It's not really a competitive advantage as it applies to opposing counsel, but it's a competitive advantage advantage with my bank account where I can say now it doesn't I can settle a case this week that would typically maybe three or four or five years ago might take me six more months to have that case settled. Um, that's where technology that's where I leverage it the most is just getting from start to finish or at least start to possible finish as fast as possible thank you brooks um we briefly mentioned you know customers happy and uh you know i guess for every good business it's important to to make customer experience better and, and you know uh, serve customers better so do you think uh you know getting more tax savvy as a smaller firm will influence your ability to serve clients your clients better brooks why don't you go on and answer that question as well I think what I just said a second ago about that makes me happier, the, the faster I can get from start to finish mm -hmm. inside my four walls for my bank account purposes, <laughs> it's exactly the same for the client, right? Like mm -hmm. the client that comes into my office typically is in desperate need. They're out of work. Um, they don't know how they're going to pay their medical bills. Even if they have health insurance, they don't know anything that's going on. And the faster that I can get answers to them, which I can use technology through video, through previously produced videos, um, email campaigns from inside of our office to keep them informed about the typical process. Right. And then outside of that, with our document generation, things like that, we can get them to the point where we can hand them a check faster. And that is always what clients want. Clients want that whatever they came to you for, they want it done as fast as humanly possible or as fast as computer possible. If we're talking about what we're doing in here today. Right. So like it not only makes your law firm more efficient, but in that efficiency comes happy people who will gladly go click on the YouTube or I'm sorry, click on Google and give you a review, which is the driving force for all of our business nowadays. So I think it's their hand in hand in hand or hand in foot, whatever the right terminology mm -hmm. is. <laughs> Thank you, Brooks. Owen, oh, would you like to add anything? Well, I, I think that Brooks is is spot on with with most of this. You know, it's the 
the quicker that you're able to turn around good product, right? The happier client's going to be. But I think there's another step also, which is um, if you're able to turn around that product faster while also paying more attention to the client, right? The, the more points of contact that are good points of contact with your client, the more likely they are to refer you to a friend or to come back for another matter or, or things like that. So, you know, I would much rather have the conversation where I'm saying, Hey, we're doing this, you know, here's the update. This is really good. As opposed to, you know, six weeks after, a, you know, an initial strategy session for, you know, a, a startup company say, so where's the operating agreement? What's going on? Right. Can I get an update, Owen? Can I get an update, Owen? Right. Can I get exactly. an update, Owen? Can I get so, an update? <laughs> so the if if you can process the the tech workflows, you can be in control of that narrative in a way that otherwise you're just reactive. Thank you, Owen. Joshua, anything else from you? On making customers happy with by using well, technology. Again, I, I I can only express this with a little bit of humor, which is I am exceedingly fat and lazy. Okay. <laughs> Cause I mean, obviously Brooks is there at a standing desk. I can tell that. Okay. Y'all can see the, exactly. He's at the standing desk. Cause that man's a hunter. Okay. But Owen and I are much more similar in that we're lazy. I don't want to go to court and I don't want to go find new clients and the fastest way, right? So the fastest way to do that, if you're fat and lazy with a nice glass of tea with a little bit of honey is whiskey. Is there whiskey in there, Josh? Is there whiskey oh, in there? Oh, it's just honey. The, 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 <laughs> the, the bourbon's behind me. I got drafting after this, so I can't drink and draft. That's a rule. Um, <laughs> friends don't let friends drink and draft. But no, it's, it's you know, it, get, client experience is very important. And what's, and I think this is, probably more Owen than Brooks is that essentially I am much more like a, like Frankenstein. I'm so I'm working on this huge operating agreement and I'm like, and I'm working with a, with a law clerk. I'm like, all right, well pull from this, pull from that. And so you get it all together and you get it all organized and you're like, and it looks like, garbage and you can't show the client that so if technology using technology to leverage that and it, and even if it's all wrong and it could really be all wrong it's a first draft they could be like i don't want any of that stuff you know what are you talking about foreign certification and and factor what are you all this crazy no i don't want any of that but it looks right okay and just like i'm sitting here you know, in a vest and a tie and a collared shirt where this morning I was in a Hawaiian shirt, shorts, and a t-shirt that said, do not anger the volcano God. It's got to look right. That's There's when you open up your shirt right there and say, do not anger the volcano God. I'm sure. Do not anger the volcano God. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I mean, it's, it, it's all about customer impression. Okay. And I mean, don't get me wrong. We got to do it right. But it's so much in law you know, doing it the right way is almost more important sometimes than being right. And I think Brooks will back me up on that as a, as a guy who litigates all the time. If you do it the wrong way, doesn't matter if you're right. <laughs> you can have a busload full of nuns to swear on it. The judge doesn't, don't care. <laughs> Thank you, Joshua. Uh, well, maybe you could continue and actually answer my next question. And it's about uh, you know, modifying your business processes before implementing or adopting technology? Because, I mean, we understand it's based on your answers, it's important to implement technology, but what about the process of implementation? Do you need to make any changes to your business? It's it's all organic. Uh, a lot of the push for my firm was pandemic-related initially, uh, and actually before pandemic. My, my senior associate in litigation who... I've known since the first day of law school. She was a night student and I was a day student. And she and her husband worked for me the, you know, my entire career as litigators. Uh, she broke her foot in she broke her foot in January 
uh, excuse me. Um, she broke her foot in January of, uh, no, I'm sorry, in September of 2020. Um, no, sorry, 2019. And so we implemented all this technology because she was like going to retire. And then I said, do you want to retire? And she said, not really. I like working. Uh, and so we implemented all this technology uh, to keep her in the, in the, in the game. And so when the pandemic rolled around, uh, we just flipped the switch on for everybody. And so it, it ends up being in part a logical focus and in part organic. Now, the, a lot of the other stuff, including Lalio, is I couldn't get a law clerk to train. Right now, I'm training law clerks on teams which is nuts, okay? It's kind of crazy, but we're, we're making it work. Um, but, you know, Owen, you know, and I don't know about Brooks's office, is normally law clerk comes in with a draft. I have ruler, I have pencil, I mark it up, I hand it back to him. You can't do that. We're doing everything with red lines. Um, and so what I've been trying to do is push the, the the juniors and the law clerks into more thinking roles using the thoughtless tasks, putting those towards um, towards innovation and technology. So I don't think you can prepare the law firm. It's the kind of thing where, like I said, a Frankenstein's monster, and it has to be integrated in over time. Thank you, Joshua. Owen, would you like, do you have anything to add? Yeah, you know, I I think that I mean Josh is right. If you think you're going to have a plan, that plan lasts for the first two days, and then you realize that the plan isn't going to be sufficient, and you have to sort of grow as as it comes. But it is very important um, to to understand why why you are using the tech and what problem you're trying to solve. Um, I think it's really common for people to to look at some uh, app or program or something and say, "That's amazing. That's going to solve all of my problems." But if you don't really know what your problems are, and that's just the sort of abstract notion of things aren't the way that I want them to be right now, there, there's no program or AI or uh, automation that you're going to be able to put in place that solves an undefined problem. So, you know, it, it, one of the things that that I've seen uh, colleagues of mine do, they they go and they find the new shiny object and they they say, I'm going to use this without really understanding why or what they intend for that product to do for them, what what kind of um, issue it's going to solve either for them as, as an attorney or for, for their clients. Um, so, you know, it, 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 I agree with Josh 100% that a plan, you know, as far as the, the implementation isn't gonna work, but you have to understand, I think, or have a, a, enough self-knowledge about you and your firm as to what you want the tech to accomplish. Um, otherwise, you're just sort of flying blind and it might work, um, but you're almost inevitably gonna be disappointed with what it is that you implement. And I'd piggyback, I'd piggyback on that a little bit too. It's If you're going to implement technology, there we all have processes in our office, right? Most of those in a small firm small law firm, most of those processes are all housed in the lawyer's head or in the paralegal's head that's been working for you for five years or three years or the, or the longest amount of time, right? So if you're going to implement technology, you've got to get all of that, those processes out on a piece of paper to figure out how can I use technology that can bridge some of these gaps in there right so like if you were a small law firm and you're like hey i want to be paperless right i want to have i want to have a paperless office well you, you can't just walk in and say to your employees hey we're going to go paperless now here's a scan snap throw it on their their desk right and have them go about the business right 
you have to set up, okay, here's how we're going to save the files, right? Here's where we're going to name the files. Here's what we're going to do when they come in the mail. This is, and, and you have to have all of those things written out so that the person who's sitting at the desk today, or rather, no, no matter if it's the person sitting at the desk today or the person that's sitting at the desk in three years, they walk in the door, you say, here's what we, how we do the mail. And you point them to a file, right? Or you point them to a wiki or you point them to a whatever. And now they know how to do the mail, right? So you have to get those processes out of your brain and figure out whether or not the way that I'm doing it in my head fits with the technology I want to implement or do I need to, you know, move that around to, to make those more, to use Josh's term, the more menial tasks. I got to get those processes out because we do them all the time, right? We do crappy we, uh, one of my friends calls it polishing the silver, right? We polish the silver in a small firm all the time, right? The we arrange the deck chair. The owner, yeah. right? Yeah, the, the chef or the owner of the restaurant does not need to be polishing the silverware. And he also doesn't need to be telling the staff how to polish the silverware or that it's time to polish the silverware. Those processes need to be in place so that the owner or the chef or whoever can be making a, a really great halibut dish, right? Or at home with his kids, not having to get to the kitchen yet, right? Um, so I think that's 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 how I always think about it. Like, yeah, I want to do technology. Like Owen's saying, like, my friend just bought this new technology. He just got this new software, right? But there, you got to figure out a way. How do those processes work in your brain? And how are they fit into your office? And how can I make those things fit into that piece of technology? The, the way I like to think of it is, is the more pointed the problem and the more direct the technology is the solution, the more likelihood of success. Okay. I mean, because it, it, again, the, you know, doing that, like Owen said, that broad brush of it's going to solve all my problems. I'm like, oh, it's not going to work. <laughs> it's like, like I have a program that does this. Okay. I have a program that does something else. And that's what they're used for. And they don't mix and match. Right. I mean, I think that's an important thing. The, the, the more things that a uh, software or program claims to do, the higher the likelihood that it's not going to do any of those particularly well. Right? Um, just like lawyers. Just yeah. like lawyers. Absolutely. <laughs> um, you know, and and, through personal injury. Right. Uh, and if you're using a bunch of different softwares, depending on what kind of tech you've implemented, you want to make sure that their APIs can talk with each other and that, you know, information can flow back and forth and things like that. Not all do. And, you know, if if you are deciding among um, several different uh, tech platforms or, or applications or things like that, um, if they don't all talk to each other, you have to you have to figure out okay which one's most important to me, and then go find other programs that are going to uh, speak the same language. You see, I, I'm I'm lucky in that I run my entire firm off Max mm -hmm. have for 2003. Nothing works for them, so it's perfect. They all work great. You know, they all work poorly together, so it works. The advantage is is that when my systems go down. I unplug, I count to 10, and they mostly always come back, even including after Hurricane Sandy, where my 15th floor office got flooded, okay? Well, I did get flooded, but the, the electric, yeah, there's no electricity in lower Manhattan. I'm sitting in my car, and all of a sudden, my practice managing server comes back on because they turned the lights back on, and it rebooted. Perfect. Well, thank you. Thank you for sharing. Um, I guess uh, my next question would be about involving your team in the process of technology implementation. If, let's say you have a paralegal or, or an associate. Should you involve them, you know, in, in this process or how should it be settled? I can give a quick answer to that. If okay. you don't involve your team, it will not be implemented. Um, I, I want to piggyback in that and go, <laughs> I work with a bunch of Luddites. I got them using the billing program and the practice manager. I consider that a major, a major <laughs> victory for our side. It's all about, it's all about the level of, it's all about the level of comfort with technology. As I mentioned, 
you know, I have an associate who's my head litigator who basically is old enough to be my mom. Okay. She remembers a time before computer. She remembers a time before television because she lived in Appalachia. Okay. But what made her adopt technology was pain. Okay. Give up the job or work remotely. So to some extent, and I understand I'm the most tech savvy guy in the office. So I've been, I've done tech support for the last two years of the pandemic, but it's pain. Um, I don't necessarily agree that you should make it their choice. You make it painful for them not to do it. And then they will adopt a more uh, adoptive attitude, if you will. I'll, I'll I think also sort of showing them kind of how it's going to make their, you gotta, there's, you gotta have like, a, I guess a kind of a double-edged sword or show them two things, right? You gotta say, this is gonna make your life and our life a lot easier and simpler. And to go along with that, if you do adopt this stuff and start using it, it's also not gonna cost you your job. Because right? that's sometimes what people think that when they, oh, we're really, we're automating all these letters, right? This is this is all I do every single day is write these letters, these ten letters, right? Like, and now we just click a button and they all get done, right? So they think you have to paint those two. This is going to make our lives easier. Your job of reviewing and whatever the case may be is going to be a lot easier, and you're going to get to do different stuff, right? Like, you have more space to think, more space to plan more space to get me coffee i'm just kidding um <laughs> but it's a it's a you know it's a technology when it comes to your employees can be a double-edged sword where you're making their lives easier but you're also potentially threatening their their job by technologying it technologying it yes I guess next logical question is, do you think that, you know, the embracing technology in your company actually affects your hiring process? Yes. Owen, yeah. Um, you know, the, going back to what both Josh and Brooks were just talking about, um, it's much easier to get people to uh, buy in if you hire them when they've already bought in. Mm. Um, you know, if you have existing employees who are somewhat resistant to to change, you know, I, I agree that the way you get them into it is you say, look, this is going to make your, your life a lot easier, right? I mean, th this isn't for me. It, I mean, it is for me, but it's it's for, for you, for your daily life, it's going to be easier. Um, I don't know why you would hire somebody who you have to have that fight with. Um, you know, so in, in some ways, it allows you to um, already prime the pump for for your employee to be doing the work that, that you want them to do in the way that you would like them to do it. I, I think hiring someone to go during the onboarding go, and this is how we do that. Okay. <laughs> As opposed to my longtime employee who, again, did not did not like the fact that we went to a cloud-based file system until she had to use it because she was stuck at home. Um, it, you know, you, you end up having a lot of discussions over these things that don't need to happen. Makes sense. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, I guess my next question uh, is about, you know, the biggest lesson you've learned from adopting legal technology, and maybe perhaps you could also share what is the hardest part of implementing legal technology? Uh, Brooks, why don't you start and then we can talk with the rest. What, what was the question, the biggest lesson and the, what, uh, Yeah, the, the biggest lesson learned from adopting legal technology and the hardest part of implementing legal technology. I think the biggest lesson is what I've talked about a little while ago is getting all of the crap out, out of your brain um, and onto a piece of paper. Um, there was a long period of time we've been paperless since basically the beginning in 2008 when I opened up, but 
that was like the pinnacle of my technology for a long time. I was still operating in a way of find the old, find the old summons and complaint for the Jones case that I did the, um, the car accident on last week or screaming down the hall. Hey, Mary, can you come down here real quick? I got this, you know, like that, those lessons of like, okay, I got to step back from the stuff, right? And write down how we make the sausage, right? Like not just in my brain of, of telling someone, yeah, go grab the, the Smith matter. We did a jury demand in that. When, you know, like that just doesn't, you think, and also telling yourself, it, I'm not that important, right? That's another thing that lawyers have to get out of their their brain, out of their own way is like, there's a lot of stuff going back to polishing the silver. There's a lot of stuff that you think you do really well in your office that everybody else can do just as good if you just let them. And you gave them the training and gave them the teaching and gave them the, the automation of the process to put it in place, right? You don't, the lawyer doesn't have to be doing most of the stuff that the lawyer does. If you can get all the process out of your brain and put them on, on paper. Um, but that's been the hardest thing for me is really getting those things out of my brain and then realizing, oh shit, this works. This is a lot better. Sorry, again, I cussed again. Um, but, <laughs> um, but it's, it's a, lot, a whole lot better. Once you get that stuff out of your brain and get a process and get the form and you get the button in your thing and you get the document automation where you can just say, all right, let's, let's move this case into this phase and then push a button and you got three documents ready that can go out right away. Like that's a whole lot better than, than telling somebody, okay, go get this, go get this file, pull this search for this search for a motion to amend. And then we can get it all together. Right. Like, um, that's been the biggest lesson for me. Thank you, Brooks. Owen, what about you? Uh, it, it, to piggyback a little bit on on, on what Brooks says, I, it, it is critical to um, express uh, what you know to the other people who need to know what you know. Um, you can also use um, tech to do this. Um, I, I had been working on uh, putting together a bunch of videos for a uh, an email um, uh, a string of um, things for potential clients. And I realized that Loom automatically gives a uh, transcript of what you say. So I just started Looming myself when I was doing things and talking through what I was doing. And now I've got a library of things that I can just say, just, just go check the wiki. All right. That's, that's awesome, Owen. That's awesome. Um, you know, because that way you, you solve a bunch of problems that at once, you know, for me, part of it was I got comfortable sitting by myself talking into a camera to nobody, which is pretty uncomfortable to do. Really. Um, right. You know, so uh, you get to practice, you know, that aspect of, of getting the marketing down, but also um, getting the stuff out of your brain. Um, one of the biggest lessons that I learned was don't try to do everything at once. Um, if you try to implement five different, you know, um, uh, 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 new technology solutions, you're not going to pay attention to any one of them very well. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's important to remember that, you know, if you get a little bit better every day, it's a lot better than trying to do everything and not making any progress. Um, you know, and it, I know that I felt, you know, I'm pretty tech savvy. I've been coding since Perl was still the language that people used. Um, I thought that I could just sort of walk in and do this. Uh, it turns out I already have two full-time jobs. I practice law and I run a business. I don't have time to sit in and really spend all this time coding or, or implementing technology or figuring out the entire workflow all at once. Not unless, you know, um, I ever want to see my wife again or, you know, uh, walk to my dog and then she looks at me and says, who the hell are you? Um, you know, so don't, don't try to fix everything at once and find the most pressing things or, or start with the easiest things just to get a win and go from there. Thank you, Owen. Joshua, and a comment from you. I, I, I want to, again, build on what Owen said, which is, Technology 
is a lever. It's not a substitute. Um, or if you prefer, to err is human, to really screw things up, you need a computer. So, so by way of example, I'm working on a huge operating agreement for a client. I'm not letting my staff use the document production software because they're still learning. They need to learn the basics and you need to learn the basics of what you're doing and then build on that. Uh, because you can't, the technology is very rarely a substitute for you. Okay. It's just going to free you up to do more of what you should be doing, which is the high value time. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Joshua. So I guess this is a good uh, time for us to switch to questions from the audience. Let's see uh -oh. what, we, what we have there. The first question is from Jamie. How do you know which legal tech applications to use when there are so many out there and when your time and money is limited? Who would like to go with that? Owen, maybe you? I'll say, I'll, I'll go ahead, Owen. I'm sorry. No, 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 go for on. it. You're already in the middle. Go. Go for it. I, I would say get into there are a ton of um legal tech groups on linkedin there are a ton of legal tech groups on uh facebook private groups if you know if you if you don't hate facebook or everybody hates facebook but if you don't hate it too bad and you're but you're willing to do some private groups there are a ton of private groups there um one that i'm a part of is the maximum lawyer um facebook group they're a podcast and a um and a fairly large facebook community um you can hop in those groups and ask questions um don't try to do research on all these things all on your own you don't want to end up on i don't know whatever captera website or whatever website trying to make sense of all the 4.8 ratings right just mm -hmm. ask even if you don't know anyone personally like you don't have a friend down the street to ask get on those social media platforms Shoot, you probably could type in, hey, hashtag law Twitter. Um, I need help with the practice management software. I'm trying to do document management. I'm sure hashtag law Twitter would come swooping in and help you tremendously. Um, so there's a lot of avenues to figure those things out. Don't I wouldn't rely on Google for that. I'd rely on, um, you know, maybe your pen pals on social media or people you don't know on social media with hashtags and things like that. Thank you, Brooks. Uh, Owen or Joshua, would you like to add anything? There's certainly nobody to talk to in small town Simpsonville in South Carolina about what kind of practice management software to be using. So um, I'm not fancy like Josh in New York City, you know. Oh, nobody wants to talk to you in New York City either. Okay, <laughs> I, I would say I, I would say to build on a prior point that we made, which is if you're going to be implementing tech, make it be pointed in the problem you're solving. And then unfortunately, you're gonna kiss a few frogs. And that's what, that's what you know, seven days free trial is all about, which is try them out. You, you, you know, some things you're like, oh, that's gonna be genius. Like five minutes into this, I'm like, no, delete right to the trash. And some things you grow with. Um, you know, I, I've, uh, I've been working with Lalio and and I give them uh, sample contracts to help with their AI, you know, and it, it's going to be a, a trial and error problem. Thank you. Thank you, Joshua. Yeah, I, I, I would add just one real quick thing, which is um, don't be afraid to reach out to other attorneys. Most of us are uh, pretty generous with with time to help other attorneys. Um, I've benefited from that a lot. I've reached out to people. I had no idea who the hell they were, right? Um, and you know, just from a, um, a quick uh, message on LinkedIn or something like that, I was on a Zoom call with them and, and picking their brain. Um, one of the things that lawyers are really bad about, but I think getting a bit better, is that we think that we have all these secrets. None of us have new ideas. We are just putting them in slightly different arrangements, right? So... I think a lot of attorneys are going to be more generous with giving you the secrets than, than you might think that they would be. Thank you. Uh, let's see our next question. Can you provide a specific example of tech helping, let's say for customiz customizing NDAs or how 
you use software to reduce contract draft iterations? Uh, sure. Um, with my estate planning clients, I have them fill out a pretty significant questionnaire. Um, it fills in, um, depending on whether they have a trust-based plan or a will-based plan, five or six different documents that are uh, put together with conditional logic, depending on certain things that they answer in the questionnaire, it will trigger different provisions within the automated document. Um, so, you know, with something like an NDA, if you have um, either uh, your client or, you know, um, an assistant or something like that, fill out uh, a questionnaire um, based on the information that you get from the client, you can get together a pretty um, close NDA. And then uh, there's always, always a little bit of editing at the end just to make sure that things are just so. Um, but the, uh, the, the power of conditional logic in these things is, is pretty amazing. Um, so if you put in the time to understand the document and to understand the conditional logic, you can get 98% of the way uh, to a finished uh, product. Thank you, Owen. Uh, shall we see our next question? Because I think we have time maybe for one or two more. Uh, question from Brooke. Uh, is it profitable and safe to delegate the technical transformation of the company to third parties? Joshua? I, I'm just going to go with, you're going to need help, but I'd be real careful about that because I had a issue with a cloud-based system that didn't allow you to de-cloud base. And that basically meant that my, my poor little assistant, Jenny, went through every file and downloaded every document. And we, and we reformed it, and it's what had to happen. Uh, I'd be very, very cautious if it if it looks and feels like a, a magic black box. Yeah, I mean, tr trust but verify, right? You know, mm -hmm. don't don't ever just hand everything over and say, "Okay, make it happen." You you need to be a co pilot in the whole process. I was going to say two things. There is first thing is make sure. You back up, 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 right? If you're using a third party software, whatever that is, be intelligent and do some investigation about what their backup processes are like. And then also make sure you have a copy of at least everything that you are uploading to them, right? Um, the second thing would be what we have used I want to say third parties in two different ways, third parties being a company and then third parties being maybe a virtual assistant or someone else that's not inside the four walls of your business. And I use that four walls loosely, like your employees inside the four walls might be home or whatever. But I have, I have learned it's really great when you're shopping for a human third party that can help you move documents or review, um, review forms and requests and make sure things have been done or not done using things like Fiverr or Upwork because you get to look at all these reviews and the writings about the humans and the work they've done over the last few years that you don't get when you are putting an application on you know Facebook or Craigslist or whatever and the, and the human walks in and you get to do a background check on them or you get to call their former employer employer who loves them they don't give you the former employers that don't like them right but all those things are present online at upwork or something like that so there is the uh, trust but verify i think josh said that i mean it was owen that was the up. flip side of that is when you when you're looking for another somebody else to help you implement because there's a lot of people out there that can help you implement different pieces of software um right there's there are there's a uh, one of our friends is a has a company she's a lawyer and has a legal support staff in las vegas and you can hire them to do the work for you to get your your practice management software to where you want it to be so what, what Owen was talking about earlier you don't have to spend time also programming you talk to them a little bit i think it's called like legal support help i believe is what they're called um her name is sandy van um but that's another way that you can be profitable, make it safe, and be able to implement tech while you're still doing lawyer work 
and not having to learn how to, you know, code with Zapier or something like that, or actually code with Perl like uh, Owen does on Friday nights. Thank you. <laughs> Thank hey, you, Briggs. It's, it's a great time, I'll tell you. <laughs> uh, we are almost out of time, but I think we have time for one more really quick question before we have to end. So let's see. How do you guard against hitching your wagon to tag that doesn't last beyond a few years and then leaves your practice in the lurch? Question from Jamie. Back up, back up, back up. Back up. And I also think that's a I think that's a boogeyman. I don't know if that if that if you do a lot of research on the front end and you're getting some of the things you're you're getting you're hitching your wagon to a little bit more established company it might be sometimes people are like i don't want to do this because i'm scared that 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 one of these companies might fold and then you you don't actually commit to doing something that's going to move your practice forward because you have a, a concern about a potential problem out there I would say research, talk to friends, talk to social media, find the right thing, do it, research, and then back up, back up, back up, back up, back up. So you're not left with like what Josh was when trying to get his paralegal to download all the documents. Uh, I will follow that on and say it is just this question really is just what scares us. The, the, the most important thing you can find is an off ramp. If the software has an off ramp, you'll be fine because it doesn't matter how big or small the entity is. And again, I'm going to date myself. Who here started their practice with Corel WordPerfect? Okay. I've, I did have that at one point in time. Right. Okay. You and had my, to, right? I think you had to use that for federal court, I believe, it for a long period of time. You didn't have I'm to. I'm right. You, you didn't have, have to. to use it, but it was, it, it was so good about formatting that every litigator wanted to use it and again the woman martha who i keep mentioning over and over again to this day she's been with me since 2008 Corel died in 2005 maybe six she still when when she can't as a problem with microsoft word i can hear her grumbling and i swear i'm hearing her say word perfect you know so it doesn't matter how big or small an entity is any entity could go down in a hell of bullets, okay? Word could go down, okay? It, that's not, that. don't let that stop you. Just make sure there's an off-ramp where you can obtain your data in some form or fashion. Yeah, Owen, did you want to say anything? Oh, I, only that, you know, I, I agree <laughs> with, with both of my colleagues here. Uh, the off-ramp is important. Do your research. Also recognize that some companies that that look brand new, um, the people behind them might not be. Right, the people who um, uh, were behind, you know. Um, so one of the programs or applications that I use is called Lawmatics, and it's pretty new. And I was really hesitant to use it until I realized that the team behind it was the team that created my case, which is oh. one of the more established, you know, practice management groups. And that gave me a, a lot of confidence to say, okay, these people actually know what they're doing, right? So a little bit of research can can give you that 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 extra boost to, to actually make you comfortable enough. Um, but again, as, as as Josh said, you can't guarantee that anything's going to stick around. Even Facebook can go down. I mean, yeah. wait. <laughs> wait. <laughs> That's a good be, one. Be so lucky. And the world was a better place for five hours. Every Six. Monday, it should go down. Six. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, thank you. Thank you, Owen, uh, Brooks, Joshua. Thank you for your answers. And now we actually have to choose the winner for the best question today. Which one was your favorite question? I need a list. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, we had a question from maybe we could look through them quickly Let yeah, me see we, I, I think, think we got so caught up answering them we forgot what they were yeah, yeah. exactly <laughs> let me see maybe our team can show them uh right now on the screen one by one how do you guard against hitching from jamie 
And then the next one, is it profitable and safe to delegate from Brooke? And then the next one, can you provide a specific example of tech helping days? How do you know which legal tech applications to use? I don't think we we had one though. Did I like, we? I like Jamie or Heather. Yeah, yeah I like I, I, I like Jamie. I gotta tell you. All right, let's go with Jamie. Okay, Jamie, yeah. congratulations. Thank you so much for your question. And uh, everyone, actually, thank you so much for sending us your questions. You've been really great and active today. And I know there are many more questions out there, and we will actually try to answer them uh, a bit later. Maybe our wonderful speakers will also comment on, on those questions later, and we can do like a post or something on, on LinkedIn with, with the, the answers. So, uh, Jamie, once again, congratulations. And actually, can you drop a line to support.lawyer.com so that our team could get in touch with you and provide you with instructions on how you could get your present? Uh, well, we actually have one more uh, kind of secret contest. Uh, we announced it last time as well. But once again, you can uh, have it, you can get a chance to win $100. Uh, dollars amazon gift card and one year subscription to loyo if you will suggest the idea for the topic of our of one of our next events so um all you have to do is go to our linkedin um, club uh, legal productivity club on linkedin and write an interest in non-trivial topics below our latest posts and we will select a few ideas and do a poll or a voting and decide which one was the best so we really want to to learn, you know, what topics are of, of the most interest to you. So uh, go ahead and submit us your ideas. And uh, Joshua, Owen, Brooks, thank you so much. This was such a pleasure. I mean, I had a lot of fun. I'm pretty sure our audience also enjoyed it a lot. And we've learned a lot from you. And this was really, really uh, informative and insightful. So thank you so much for joining us today. It was really a pleasure. And uh, Tomorrow, we will make sure to send recording of this event to everyone who was registered for this webinar. And, uh, you know, I would love to encourage our audience to join our next event, which is going to take place on October 13th. And we will have the honor to chat with Sarah Wies about tips, tools, and learning resources to write better legal content. So, unfortunately, I have to end. Owen, Joshua, Brooks, once again, thank you. Thank you so much. And I hope we'll, we'll get a chance to chat with you again during our future events. Thank you. See y'all. Thank you, guys. Bye.